NASA has been trying to get astronauts into deep space for many decades, and now it seems that goal is about to be achieved. They've tested many experiments over the years, and many have failed, but some increasingly prove that they could help us explore space better. As we proceed, we'll take you through the timeline of experiments NASA has undertaken and how they finally came up with this incredible light-speed machine that shocks everyone and scares some. Space opens up a world of possibilities, and many things we believe to be impossible will prove possible when we eventually get to explore the galaxies that lie beyond. This makes NASA's continuous efforts impressive, and many are curious to know how they do what they do. If you're curious too, join us as we explore how NASA builds the impossible light-speed engine to break the laws of physics. The big challenge with sending humans into space is that space itself is incredibly vast. That's why scientists came up with the concept of light years just to describe them. Light year defines the distance light can cover in a year, roughly 6 trillion miles or 10 trillion kilometers. For instance, light takes about one second to travel from the moon to our eyes, so the moon is one light second away. On the other hand, sunlight takes about eight minutes to reach us, making the sun eight light minutes away. Alpha Centauri, the closest star system, is 4.3 light years away, and objects beyond our solar system can be billions of light years out. That's why when astronomers observe distant objects, they're essentially looking back in time. Scientists have been trying to figure out how to travel at such a mind-boggling speed. Elon Musk's SpaceX aims to colonize Mars, but the journey takes several months, or even close to a year, depending on the planet's positions. With the speed of light travel, the trip could be made in less than four minutes. However, to go faster, we need more kinetic energy, and it takes an enormous amount of energy to achieve even a tiny fraction of light speed. The M-Drive is an example. It is a device with a tapered copper cylinder and a resonant radiation field inside, causing microwave standing waves to bounce around. It uses microwaves to create thrust without traditional fuel. That's a game changer because conventional rockets have to carry a ton of mass to move forward. Roger Scheuer, the M-Drive's inventor, claims that thrust happens due to differential radiation pressure between its ends, but this explanation breaks the law of conservation of momentum unless those photons escape the device and turn it into a photon thruster. And even if they do, the thrust is tiny. EagleWorks, NASA's Advanced Propulsion Physics Laboratory, tried to replicate Shawyer's measurements in various tests, but none have been conclusive. They even ran the latest test in a vacuum chamber to rule out thermal convection messing with the results. They used a torsion balance to measure any force accurately. The results showed a positive thrust at different power levels, but it's still way smaller than Shawyer claimed. Even at its best, it's not enough to power hoverboards, let alone time-traveling machines. However, it could be useful for long-range space travel since it eliminates the need for propellant. Many scientists also remained skeptical about the M-Drive capabilities, and tests suggested that previous positive results were due to external forces. But here's where it gets interesting. The warp drive, a concept that seemed like science fiction, has shown promise. Dr. Eric Lentz, an experienced physicist, has been working on making it a reality. While he wasn't the first, his work holds potential. The warp drive, if successful, could revolutionize our understanding of the universe and space travel. Back in 1994, a Mexican mathematician named Miguel Alcubier sparked the whole warp drive discussion with his proposal, now known as the Alcubier warp drive. However, it's essential to remember that Alcubierre didn't set out to design a spaceship propulsion system. Instead, he was diving into the realm of theoretical physics and exploring the possibilities allowed by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. In the early 20th century, Einstein's groundbreaking theory introduced the idea that the fabric of space and time is not static, but can warp and bend in the presence of energy and matter. This revolutionary concept was a foundational pillar of modern physics, fundamentally altering our understanding of the universe. Alcubierre's genius lay in taking these theoretical concepts and pushing them to their limits. He wondered whether it might be possible to manipulate space-time to facilitate faster-than-light travel, essentially creating a shortcut through the cosmos. 
His theoretical framework involved the creation of a warp bubble or warp field around a spaceship, within which space-time would warp in a specific manner. This warp field would compress space behind the spaceship while expanding it in front, generating a propulsion effect without the need for conventional rocket propulsion. It was as if he had found a way to ride on a wave of space-time curvature. Now, what made Alcubierre's work so groundbreaking was not just the audacity of the idea, but also the fact that it was a legitimate solution to the Einstein field equations, the mathematical foundation of general relativity. In essence, it was a valid interpretation of the theory, even though it relied on hypothetical concepts like exotic matter with negative energy density. Alcubierre's proposal opened the door to discussions about the potential for faster-than-light travel, a concept that had long been the stuff of science fiction. His work caught the attention of both the scientific community and science fiction enthusiasts, leading to extensive discussions and debates. One of the biggest stumbling blocks is the requirement for exotic matter with negative energy density. This exotic matter is crucial for creating the warp bubble, allowing spacecraft to travel at warp speed. Yet exotic matter remains purely theoretical and has never been observed in the natural world. Additionally, the energy demands of a warp drive are astronomical, quite literally. Alcubierre's original calculations suggested that it would take more energy than the entire observable universe contains to propel even a moderately sized starship. While subsequent studies attempted to reduce this energy requirement, it remained far from practical. Another puzzle is the issue of causality and paradoxes. Warp drives have the potential to create closed, time-like curves, leading to time travel paradoxes like the grandfather paradox. Resolving these paradoxes poses a significant challenge. However, recent developments have reignited hope for warp drives amidst these challenges. Researchers at the Advanced Propulsion Laboratory at Applied Physics have proposed a new model for a physical warp drive. Unlike previous concepts that relied on negative energy or exotic matter, this model utilizes the behavior of space-time bubbles to achieve warp-like travel, as already mentioned. In the following years, subsequent studies aimed to refine and address some challenges posed by the Alcubierre warp drive, such as the enormous energy requirements and the paradoxes associated with time travel. Scientists and theorists grappled with the theoretical implications, exploring whether such a propulsion system could ever become a reality. Chemical rockets, while effective, might seem a bit primitive when you break them down. You load up tons of fuel, either liquid or solid, add an oxidizer, set it all on fire, and let the explosive gases provide the push needed to send your rocket in the opposite direction. However, they're inefficient. The Falcon Heavy, for example, is a behemoth weighing in at 550 metric tons. It carries nearly 400 tons of fuel and oxidizer. The first stage burns for a mere 162 seconds, and the second lasts 397 seconds. In total, that's about 9.5 minutes of burn time. This inefficiency has driven scientists to explore alternative forms of propulsion, especially for long journeys in space. However, Alcubierre's proposal has helped us make strides in developing concepts like ion drives and warp drives. One of the most promising solutions so far is the ion thruster. These ion drives are relatively slow but incredibly fuel efficient, making them a good option for various space missions. While the most efficient chemical rockets eject hot gases at about 5 kilometers per second, ion engines kick it up several notches by expelling individual atoms at a blistering 90 kilometers per second. This higher velocity translates to a significantly more efficient acceleration. While the best chemical rockets operate at around 35% efficiency, ion engines clock in at an impressive 90%. These engines can run for days, weeks, or even months, tirelessly accelerating long after chemical rockets would have guzzled up their fuel. So once you're beyond a planet's gravity well, they become incredibly efficient tools for making dramatic changes in velocity. NASA and other space agencies have embraced ion engines with great success across various missions, though they still looked for better options. They've tinkered with this thruster concept for decades, but initially hesitated to use it in active missions due to the potential risks involved. That all changed with NASA's Deep Space One mission, launched in 1998. 
This spacecraft was a bundle of daring technologies, including low-power electronics, solar concentrator arrays, scientific instruments, and a solar electric propulsion system. The engine was run for extended periods, allowing it to make up-close observations of asteroids, comets, and even Mars. Building on deep space one's triumphs, NASA's Dawn mission took it up a notch, featuring three redundant ion engines. These engines enabled the spacecraft to orbit the asteroid Vesta, gather data, then break orbit and head to asteroid Ceres for even more exploration. Astonishingly, there might still be fuel left for additional asteroid visits. To give you a sense of their acceleration, Dawn can go from 0 to 100 km per hour in just four days of continuous thrusting. Ion thrusters have also played roles in various other missions. ESA's Smart One spacecraft used them to travel from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, and the Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft relied on ion engines. These engines have even been put through rigorous testing on Earth, where they continuously operated for more than five years. As if these successes weren't exciting enough, the future holds even more promise for ion thrusters. Researchers are exploring ways to enhance their output. One approach is to significantly increase the amount of electricity used to accelerate the ions. NASA once contemplated a mission called the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter, powered by the Nuclear Electric Xenon Ion System engine, which could have explored Jupiter's moons using ion thrusters. However, the mission was canceled back in 2005. Another avenue involves developing high-thrust versions of ion engines, like NASA's X-3 Hall thruster, capable of producing 5.4 newtons of force, a significant leap from the thousandths of newtons seen in previous thrusters. At full power, this technology could shorten the flight times for human astronauts traveling to Mars to just a few months. Engineers are gearing up for 100-hour tests of the X-3 to assess its long-term operational capabilities. The European Space Agency is also experimenting with an air-breathing ion engine. Instead of lugging propellant, this engine would draw in air molecules from the atmosphere in low Earth orbit, ionize them, and then expel them. Since the spacecraft would have access to abundant solar electricity and atmospheric propellant, it could operate for extended periods without refueling. This innovation could revolutionize space travel, allowing spacecraft to function at lower altitudes and space stations to remain in low Earth orbit indefinitely without requiring periodic boosts. One of these groundbreaking technologies is the ion drive. When the idea of ion drives was introduced, many skeptics believed it couldn't generate enough power to move a spacecraft. However, it turns out that ion drives are not just theoretical, they actually work. NASA recognized their potential and 2016 awarded a significant contract to Aerojet Rocketdyne to develop an advanced solar electric propulsion system. This system, also known as the Hall Effect Thruster, relies on converting solar power into electricity and then using it to accelerate ions, which in turn generates thrust. With the amount of development the ion drive has seen over time, some might wonder why much hasn't been done in the utilization of warp drives. Well, there are a couple of hiccups with the warp drive theory. First, scientists are still scratching their heads trying to figure out how to conjure up one of these nifty warp bubbles in a space that doesn't already have one. And even if they did manage to pull off the bubble trick, there's no exit strategy. Once you're cruising inside that warp bubble, there's no known way to make a graceful exit. In 2012, Eagleworks even decided it was high time to dive into the possibility of using the warp drive. They made an interferometer, a gadget designed to sniff out any strange spatial distortions caused by the expanding and contracting space-time of the Alcubierre metric. However, all of this led them to a dead end. Probably sometime in the future, scientists will finally understand how to use warp drives to help humans explore deep space. Now, their interests have moved from ion thrusters to nuclear thermal engines. There was a recent collaboration between NASA and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. This collaboration, known as the Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations, or DRACO, aims to speed up the development of this space-age engine. The plan is to have this advanced nuclear thermal propulsion technology running by 2027. With this snazzy new tech, astronauts could whiz to and from deep space in no time. 
Nuclear thermal rockets cut down the time it takes to get places, and that's a big deal when you're talking about places as far as Mars. Longer trips mean more supplies and more complicated systems, and we'd rather keep things streamlined. But there's more to it than just speed. Nuclear thermal rockets come with extra perks. They boost the capacity for scientific payloads and give instruments and communication systems more power to work with. At their core, these rockets have a fission reactor that generates incredibly high temperatures. This heat is then transferred to a special liquid propellant. When the propellant is released through a nozzle, it expands and shoots out, propelling the spacecraft forward. It's a high-tech way of achieving propulsion and can be three times more efficient than conventional chemical methods. The space domain is more critical than ever, impacting everything from commerce to scientific discovery and national security. These advances in space technology through the Draco Nuclear Thermal Rocket Program will make transporting materials to the moon and eventually humans to Mars more efficient and faster. It's important to note that the last time the United States conducted nuclear thermal rocket engine tests was over 50 years ago. This collaboration signifies a significant leap forward in space nuclear technology. Recent advancements in aerospace materials and engineering are ushering in a new era, setting the stage for an Earth-Moon economy. But the collaboration doesn't stop here. NASA, the Department of Energy, DOE, and Industry are working on various initiatives to harness nuclear power for space exploration. They're developing concepts for nuclear power plants that can be used on the Moon and Mars. These efforts are part of a broader plan to improve engine performance and support long-range space exploration goals. Some people have wondered why NASA moved from ion thruster engines to this new nuclear development that seems to break the laws of physics. Well, ion and plasma thrusters indeed have their merits, but they also come with some significant drawbacks that must be considered. As already mentioned, they suffer from a notably low average thrust. This means they can't provide the kind of forceful propulsion that traditional chemical rockets offer. Also, the thrusters demand substantial electrical power, often ranging from tens of kilowatts to multiple megawatts. To put it in perspective, that's like having a high-powered, electricity-hungry appliance running continuously. This poses a challenge because generating and storing such large amounts of electricity in space is no small feat. Moreover, there's the issue of potential contamination. Ion and plasma thrusters can pose a risk of contaminating the spacecraft's exterior with substances like mercury or cesium. This contamination can be problematic for various reasons, including potential damage to sensitive instruments and equipment on board. In contrast, nuclear thermal engines offer a significant advantage in terms of thrust when compared to ion thrusters. They can provide that burst of power needed to propel a spacecraft quickly. When hydrogen, specifically liquid hydrogen, or LH2, is used as the propellant, these engines boast a higher specific impulse and greater exhaust velocity than traditional chemical rockets. This translates to improved efficiency, as the spacecraft can cover more distance using less fuel. However, it's important to note that while it's more efficient, it's not a quantum leap in efficiency. In a vacuum environment, nuclear thermal engines have the potential to offer a lower empty weight for the vehicle and a higher payload percentage. This is like the engines shedding excess baggage and optimizing their cargo space. This feature is particularly advantageous for long-distance missions where every kilogram of payload matters. In essence, while ion and plasma thrusters have their own set of benefits, nuclear thermal engines step in with their higher thrust capabilities and efficiency advantages. It's all about choosing the right tool for the job and weighing the pros and cons to ensure the success of space missions. This doesn't mean these engines don't have challenges either. Once that nuclear core is up and running, approaching it becomes a risky endeavor. It and the surrounding support structures become intensely radioactive. Crew members and most robots can't get anywhere near it. They must maintain a safe distance of several hundred meters, which adds to the overall weight and complexity of the spacecraft. Beyond this, there are other problems this rocket engine poses, but scientists keep working to make it better. NASA and DARPA's collaboration aims to make space missions more efficient and set the stage for a new era of space exploration. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then click on the link appearing on your screen right now. It will lead you to another one of our interesting videos. See you there.